Boom. We're live. Alex, Sweet. thanks for joining me, man. Hey, thanks for having me. We've uh, been trying to put this one together for a while. I've been looking forward to speaking to you for some time, but of course, you've been, I think, extremely busy over the last few months. And uh, I think it was just a couple of weeks ago, you guys released some fairly big news. So for people that may not be familiar with you or River, why don't you just give us a short backstory and then bring us up to date on the on the big funding round that recently uh, took place? Absolutely. Yeah. So River, uh, we see ourselves as the best place to buy, sell, track and use Bitcoin. And our goal is to help bring Bitcoin to the world. And we like to think of our mission as bringing the best of Bitcoin to our clients. And so today we're only available in the United States. We're available in like 19 or sorry, 20 states as of yesterday. Uh, we just went live in Connecticut and uh, we serve uh, a very quickly growing number of clients who a lot of them are buying uh, Bitcoin for the first time. Uh, yeah, and so a few weeks ago, we just announced a uh, our seed fundraising. We raised $5.7 million from a number of investors, um, both in you know the Silicon Valley area and also the, around, around the world. And uh, yeah, we're going and we're really excited to be able to use that money to um, help build a Bitcoin financial institution that we want the world to have. Right. Well, that was my follow up question is like, what's the because I think a lot of these early Bitcoin companies, you have to kind of meet the market where it's at. Right. And right now, a lot of people are just trying to find just kind of streamline the method of uh, acquiring and custodying Bitcoin. Right. That's kind of step one. What's the vision for River? Like, why did you get into this business? What is it about a global Bitcoin financial uh, company that you want to create? Yeah. So. So the way we like to think about it is, you know, basically what would a bank look like if Bitcoin became the money of the world, right? And a lot of the services that it offers, a lot of the services that banks offer today would be offered in a world with Bitcoin, right? But a lot of things would also be different. Um, Bitcoin is a completely new paradigm, both from a technical perspective and uh, from a monetary perspective and the economic properties of it. And so you can't just copy and paste a bank and then, you know, throw Bitcoin custody on it and then call it a Bitcoin bank. You know, um, a, a Bitcoin bank will have very native uh, products and features that, you know, you can only build if you really specialize in Bitcoin. And uh, we're, we're focused on, you know, filling kind of both directions there. So kind of the traditional financial products that people are used to with old school money and the cutting edge novel, um, products that you can only have with Bitcoin. And those specifically, those often involve sort of non-custodial financial tooling uh, in the sense that they're products where you completely control your own keys, or it's what I like to call pseudo-custodial, where, you know, there's a there's a combination of control, or we have, you know, one or more of keys in a, in a multi-sig. And um, this creates a new sort of financial institution that you can trust, but you don't have to trust, right? And that's, that's how we see ourselves. You know, we want to build this financial institution that people do trust and people can trust, but they also don't have to trust us, right? right. And there's always this like door out. There's always this off ramp to completely, you know, taking control of your own money. And we think that a world where that, where most financial institutions are structured like that, is going to have a much more honest and uh, um, well functioning financial system. Right. And what was it about this? idea or this vision that specifically, you know, was the reason why you wanted to capitalize on it? Was it a pain point for you? Was it kind of an opportunity or hole in the market? Like, you know, why did Al, why was Alex chosen to be the one to build, you know, part of the Bitcoin financial system, the emerging Bitcoin financial system? So this, this actually goes all the way back to when I was an undergrad in college. So um, when I was a, an undergrad at the University of Maryland, I was studying aerospace engineering, but got really fascinated with economics. And uh, I just kind of started going down the rabbit hole reading different books. Um, so I first read, I think the first book I read about economics was Basic Economics by Thomas Sowell, uh, which is a book I recommend to everyone. It's pretty thick, but he just made it so um, digestible uh, to understand like the fundamentals of free market economics. And then I just kept going down the rabbit hole, I ended up reading Friedrich Hayek's Denationalization of Money and uh, got really obsessed with this idea of um, offering money, offering private money. So 
um, this is before the ICO days or anything like that. Basically, you know, I was looking at things like Liberty Dollar and uh, things in that category and trying to figure out like, why did those fail? You know, why has no one really created a successful private money um, backed by, you know, commodities or, or gold or something like that. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I was, you know, 21 or something. I, I didn't really know exactly how I would build a financial institution around its private money, but I, I kind of, it was, it just kept gnawing at me and it was a dream I had to do that someday. Um, why, why was that a dream? Did you, did you look out on the world and think, man, the existing financial system is so broken or has so many problems that that's why you wanted to maybe someday do something like that? Yeah, no, it, it all had to do with, uh, offering people access to financial services or, you know, or basically money, um, outside the purview of the federal reserve, uh, kind of all came back to this underlying belief that governments should not have a monopoly on money and it's not ethical and it's not, it's not optimal either for society or our economy. And, um, that was the underlying kind of driver there. Uh, it was, right. it was very philosophical, but at the end of the day, I'm not, I'm very pragmatic. And I do, I do believe that, you know, any, anytime you build something, you also need to have a profit motive or it's gotta be, um, it has to be, uh, uh, self-sustaining. And so mm -hmm. I thought, you know, well, here's a problem I see in the world. Okay, I think there's a better way to do it. And so if this really, truly is a better way, there's gotta be a way to bring that to the world and also make money doing it, right? And I, 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 but I couldn't quite put the pieces together. I couldn't really figure out what that would look like. And then I discovered Bitcoin, right? And then I was like, okay, this is how it's gonna happen because I, I was thinking too narrow. I was thinking, I didn't, I wasn't, I didn't have the big brain idea of Bitcoin. I was thinking, oh, I could make my own private money. And, you know, that would come with this whole host of problems that probably wouldn't have solved any, anything, you know, at the end of the day. Whereas Bitcoin was this totally new paradigm. It was not public in terms of like, it wasn't um, government controlled, but it also wasn't private. And the genius of it, you know, was something I quickly realized. And so I, I was so excited because I realized like, this is how, a financial institution that I always wanted to build would, would be built using this, this type of money for the digital era. And so, um, you know, I, I saw Coinbase at that, at that time, this was like back in 2013 was, uh, seemed to be doing very well. They seemed to be, you know, uh, so they, I thought they were going to build this company that I wanted to see exist, this you know, <laughs> Bitcoin financial institution, because back then, you know, they were focused on Bitcoin, they were doing cool right. stuff and multi-sig they had, well, they, they rolled that out. Um, and we're really onboarding a lot of people to Bitcoin. And, you know, I was a little like, oh, we well, bummer someone else did it, but I'm really glad to see someone doing it. And then, but so I ended up moving out to San Francisco after that to pursue a job as a Bitcoin engineer. Um, I ended up working at a Bitcoin startup out here called MyCoin, which was kind of like Coinbase for Taiwan. And then, um, you know, uh, I went back to grad school. I, I went to Stanford and then focused on computer security and cryptography, uh, helped teach the first Bitcoin class there. And, um, you know, fast forward a few years, uh, I, I end up starting River. I, my job, job before this, I was working at an um, investment fund that was focused on cryptocurrencies. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I realized that all these companies that I thought might build this Bitcoin bank never really did. They never really kind of, they all kind of, what I would call hit a local maximum in the sense that I think they all focused on trading and uh, flipping coins, which is very profitable and lucrative uh, for the companies who do, you know, are the market leaders there. But I don't think that's the global maximum, which is be bringing this new money to the world and building a whole new banking, a whole new bank around what's going to be the money of the future. And yeah, so I'll stop there. I was long winded, but no, no. long story short, you know, I saw a gap in what, you know, appear in the last few years and decided if no one else was going to build this, I would. Nice. Yeah, man. If anything, this show is about long winded responses, my own included. So don't worry about that. But sure. uh, so when you first encountered Bitcoin, did it click immediately? I'm getting the sense that, you know, that, like you, you were looking for something like this. You had a technical background enough to maybe spot it. Did it click immediately? It was pretty fast. So it, I think the journey went something like this over the course of a few months. It was, you know, uh, okay, what is this? I'm going to play around with it. Um, send, I'm going to send it, you know, like, you know, play with sending a transaction, bought a little bit, uh, built a little, you know, 
uh, toy website using Bitcoin and you know accepting Bitcoin you know transactions. I, I went into the cryptography behind it, you know, to really convince myself that this thing made sense um, and that this thing was going to last and not be totally broken. And then probably a few months after my initial discovery of Bitcoin and then really digging into the weeds, did I have this moment? I remember I was like sitting at a table and it just like the light bulb went off. Right. And ever since then, you know, I've just been completely obsessed. Were you guys talking about Bitcoin at this table or did it, you were just thinking to yourself and it clicked or? I was just thinking to myself, I kind of like put two and two together. Like my initial thought when learning about Bitcoin wasn't the previous um, uh, kind of dream I had had about building this financial institution. Right. I, I didn't like, I, it, it wasn't, um, I guess I, I, yeah, I just hadn't like kind of, accepted Bitcoin as this new paradigm yet. I was right. just in the exploratory phase of learning about it. And then once it like, once, I don't know, there was just that moment where it just clicked and I put two and two together and I was like, wow. So know, what did you crazy. do that night? You know, you're at the restaurant, you have this moment, you know, did you run home and start jotting stuff down or did you celebrate or what was the reaction when you actually, when it kind of clicked for you? I'm trying to remember. I, if, if any. I, mean, I think I might have... Sent, I'm like, I might've even sent an email like Coinbase or something saying, you know, you know, like, at, like I, I didn't have a, I wasn't an engineer back then. So I wasn't a software engineer. So there really wasn't much for me to do at a startup like that. But I think I asked, you know, I wanted to see if there was anything that they had for someone who just really cared about Bitcoin. Um, and then after that, uh, I think I just kept going down the rabbit hole from it. and really kind of what I realized very quickly was, okay, I needed to go, you know, specialize in like the, you know, computer side of this, right? The engineering side to really, yeah. you know, pursue this. Did Coinbase get back to you when you contacted them? Yeah, they did. Uh, there was some guy there who responded, um, said, I think like they're looking for engineers, you know, which right. I had expected. You know. Fair enough. Don't yeah. blame them. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> what do you make of, didn't, didn't they, uh, wasn't there speculation today? I don't know if it was a formal announcement that they're going, going public. Is that official I, I saw some tweets about that did they formally announce it or i'm not sure i'm not sure yeah I, thoughts I feelings if true i mean you know good i mean good for them i mean they uh they built a profitable successful company um i think uh you know it's you know it's easy to like you know crap on coinbase for you know all the all the shit coins and all that but at the end of the day they did bring a lot of people into bitcoin um i bought my first bitcoin on coinbase yeah and um you know, I uh, I think it's impressive what they built. However, I do think that they're just like we, you know, in our current banking system and our current financial system, um, there are there's room for a lot of different institutions uh, who do things different ways. And you know, I think we can do things better. Um, but time will tell. What do you think is the difference between the nature of the vision that you've you know articulated here and what you guys are doing at River and some of the other people in the space that kind of appear to be, you know, quote unquote, financial services firm for Bitcoin firms for a Bitcoin world. But, you know, in, in certain cases, maybe going for the short term, uh, you know, dollar or like, what do you think is the fundamental difference between the way the vision or the what you're trying to construct between River and, you know, basically everybody else? Yeah, I mean, I think it's easier to like, you know, have specific, make specific comparisons. Um, right. I don't know if you have a specific company in mind, but I think, you know, well, let's say Coinbase, it, you know, it's easy one to, you know, it's very public and everything. Yeah. So, um, you know, I think there's a few main differentiators uh, in terms of like now, and then kind of our directions are just very different. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, in terms of a uh, strategic direction and product offerings, uh, we're not focused on traders. Right. We're not focused on um, the, uh, you know, people who are trading daily, building bots and high frequency trading and all that. That's just not our thing. Well, we're building a we're, we're building what is effectively a, looks like a bank. We are not to be clear. We're not a chartered bank. We don't have a bank charter. But what we're building is what we think a bank would look like in a Bitcoin uh, in a Bitcoinized world. Right. And so. That means in, in terms of the products we offer, um, we're focused on uh, offering uh, a number of financial services and monetizing those as opposed to just focusing on trading, which you know you don't do when you open your bank account. You don't 
trade stuff, right? Generally. Right. Um, so, so in terms of strategic directions, it's very different. Uh, in terms of kind of our brand and the way we see the space and kind of our um, target client, uh, it's also quite different. Uh, we have very high touch client services. We believe that, you know, if you're trusting a company with a significant amount of money, you deserve to be able to talk to somebody on the phone there. Um, we think that there's a huge opportunity for treating, you know, kind of taking client services to the next level in the financial world. And we think that's a necessity to bring on the next wave of Bitcoin uh, users, especially kind of the emerging affluent to mass to, to, you know, ultra high net worth individuals who haven't yet taken the plunge into Bitcoin because it's so intimidating. And one of the reasons it's so intimidating is that the companies today that the big companies today that onboard people to Bitcoin don't have anybody to hold their hand. Right. Um, it's you're, you're kind of on your own when you sign up for Coinbase. And mm -hmm. uh, we, we get a lot of people who tried using these other products and come to us because they can talk to us. Um, so, so yeah. Uh, and then lastly, you know, we're focused only on Bitcoin and that's, Partly philosophical, we believe that Bitcoin is kind of the, you know, the big w winner in the cryptocurrency space, and that's that's really the only story here. Um, but it's also very practical, right? Uh, we can build our infrastructure and our products to focus on one thing and do it well. And kind of that's rule number one of starting a small company uh, when you're small: do one thing and do it very well. And for us, that's Bitcoin. Yeah, I've seen the the. The, I guess, welcome kits for new clients that you guys send out, right? The very nice packaging with the $100 trillion bill or trillion dollar bill from Zimbabwe. Well, we send out various denominations. I think the one we've been sending recently is 10 or 100 billion. Um, right, 100 billion. Have, you know, we have different, depending on the, the supply, you know, uh, of the of our connections in the Zimbabwe. Very, very nice touch. Well, that was what I was going to ask is like, I've always wondered how you guys got those. Yeah, we, we, got, I, guess we got, in, I guess they're not in short supply. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's uh, it's kind of funny because the, the prices vary so much when you look for them online. We have our own supply chains for that stuff. So one of those, like, uh, let's say $100 billion Zimbabwe bills on the market, how, you know, in US dollars, how much? If you, want, if you wanted to buy like one of those on eBay, it, it can be like 20 bucks or more. Um, but, you know, obviously we're not buying one-offs. But uh, That's so funny, man. Yeah. So the, the eBay market the eBay kind of Western market price for Zimbabwe dollars is probably like 10 X, 20 X or more of the market price for Zimbabwe dollars in Zimbabwe. Right. I mean, it's a, well, these are out of circulation, right? So they're, Oh, it's, okay. Yeah. These are out of circulation. These aren't the currency they use today. So what do they use today? Um, I think they've been using dollars or something that's very, that's pegged to it. Um, right. I'm not a hundred percent sure, but I actually do want to take a trip over there one of these days. Um, but yeah, it's actually a very interesting dynamic. And I, I think it'd actually be a very interesting, um, you know, for any journalists watching, I think that'd be a very interesting article to write uh, because, you know, you know, maybe like tying it back to the story of like the hyperinflation in Zimbabwe and then looking forward and saying, if you had just saved all those worthless bills back then and sold them for 20 bucks a pop on eBay, you know, that would have been a pretty good business. It's great so R, kind of like, great like, R. Great. Hyperinflation right now, just like, buy a pallet of whatever like huge bill that they're printing, put in a warehouse and then sell it to Bitcoiners 20 years from now. <laughs> Cause at some point the scarcity will return to that. You know, the, the destruction of that currency will mean that it becomes scarce in the end or something like well, that. Exactly. That's the irony of the whole thing. Yeah. Uh, but no, the packaging that you guys send out is, is really nice and it appears high touch and high quality and, you know, really conveys what I think you guys are probably trying to convey, which is, a high level of service and quality and, and that kind of stuff. Um, going back to your background for a second, one of the things I wanted to ask you was, you know, you said you were doing aerospace engineering, which is a fairly unique and specialized uh, pursuit, right? Academic pursuit, I would imagine. And probably the, um, the compensation coming out of something like that, I kind of presume is above average. Am I right in that assumption? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I actually never ended up joining an aerospace engineering firm. But I mean, you know, in, in, in the in the field of engineering, I mean, aerospace is up there in pay, but it's still not it's still not as high as like electrical or computer science. Okay. Um, Generally, the, the reason why I ask is because you know you you presumably spent a lot of time and thought and energy pursuing that track, 
And then you're yeah. starting to have, you're learning about economics, you're learning about money, you're starting to have these feelings about wanting to be involved in changing that. And then Bitcoin comes along uniquely at the time where you're in the midst of all this. And it looks like something that you could really sink your teeth into to execute on that desire that you was kind of burning in the back of your mind. How hard was it to divert course away from, you know, what you had been spending presumably many years of your life, uh, you know, working towards and go towards, you know, pursuing this from the outside, at least crazy Bitcoin thing? Not hard at all. Um, I'm not somebody who gets tied to like the past of, you know, kind of what I've worked on before. Um, I have gut feelings and I go with them. And like, it sounds like, you know, I kind of, there's like at every big point in my life where I've made a big life change, I've known it was the right choice and I didn't have any hesitation and I never looked back. And I think maybe that's just like a personality thing. Um, but did you get any family backlash or anything like that? Um, I mean, I mean, my mom, it was more, it wasn't about what I was doing so much as like moving to San Francisco, right. Away from Maryland. Uh, right. That was kind of, you know, hard on too far away. On my, on my parents, <laughs> but had nothing really to do with what I was doing so much as the, the distance. Um, right. But other than that, honestly, uh, it's been the best choices I've ever made. Yeah. So, and you know, you said you studied, you did your graduate studies in cryptography and computer science. Is that what you said? Yeah, I did a computer science master's. Yeah, at Stanford and uh, focused on security, web engineering, kind of did the whole because I didn't have an undergrad and background and an, an undergraduate background in computer science. So I also mm. kind of spent a good chunk of my degree just bolstering my kind of foundational academics and understanding of computer science. Right. So I think a lot of us come from the perspective where something like crypto cryptography and, you know, computer science was very foreign to us. And since getting involved in Bitcoin, it's been something that we've started to chip away at or try to understand more, even though it was kind of not really our bag before, but we kind of realized that, you know, it's important to have at least some grasp of these concepts. Um, from someone with your background and having pursued that um, area of study, you know, did you have any deeper takeaways about what Bitcoin represented? Like as you learn more, being someone with a greater sophisticated, you know, more sophisticated knowledge on these topics, are you even more impressed with what Bitcoin is able to achieve or how it works? Or is it less impressive or what, what's your general take? So like, yeah, so I have a number of points to make there, I guess. So, um, so yeah, you know, What's interesting is kind of my journey because I, I didn't really have a computer science background either before getting into Bitcoin. I mean, aerospace engineering was, we did some programming stuff, but it, I was still intimidated by, by the idea of writing, writing a program or something. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, you know, it was, it, it made me, and it was kind of like an insecurity too, because I was like seeing this Bitcoin stuff and I was like, well, I wish I could really, really deeply understand this. And, but the funny thing is after I made the plunge, um, which I absolutely loved, you know, and just dedicated myself to just learning this craft. Uh, I came out the other side realizing that Bitcoin isn't really like the, the monetary aspect of it is what's really deeply important. The computer science aspect is necessary, but that's not really the story here. Um, Satoshi geniusly fit together, you know, a number of existing, you know, tool piece, you know, tools from the, cryptography and computer science toolkit um, to build Bitcoin, right? Uh, and that was genius. But even as Satoshi, he wasn't, um, he wasn't some, you know, gifted uh, coder, you know, who write, wrote the most beautiful code and knew every that aspect of cryptography inside and out. Um, he just fit the pieces together, right, uh, to bring into existence an economic uh, uh, this economic system that he envisioned. And so really, in my opinion, it's the economic uh, incentive structure and to create this monetary system, that's the real genius here. And the computer science stuff is really just the toolkit to do that. Right. And, you know, what, based on, and I, I've heard that before, you know, when I spoke with Eric Voskiel, he was like, you know, so to, as you pretty much exactly what you said, you know, Satoshi brought together these different components and made something really unique but as far as like his coding skills you know he wasn't uh, certainly wasn't the best computer programmer around and you know 
I think Eric used the term like sloppy or messy or something like that. Um, but anyways, what, you know, having said that and having the vision that you had prior thinking about money and stuff, like, do you see this as, well, what, what are the drawbacks that you see in this system as someone who's now focused on building a financial system on top of that, on top of what Bitcoin represents? Yeah. Um, so, you know, I think drawbacks, like, I think uh, maybe it's better to frame the term, the, the drawbacks in terms of kind of alternatives, um, sure. you know, so maybe gold or existing money. Right. Um, so, you know, and I want to qualify this. I do think Bitcoin's long-term potential is tremendous, but I think if Bitcoin's long, like paradoxically for Bitcoin to live forever, we need to continually acknowledge Bitcoin's weak points. Right. Mm -hmm. And be viscerally aware of them so that we know like when, when to fix them. So um, I think one of the biggest ones is uh, in comparison to cash, right? Bitcoin is a lot harder to transfer anonymously um, in comparison to cash. So, uh, and I, I, I don't think it's go ever going to be possible to, you know, be more anonymous than transferring pieces of paper in the physical world, you know, using a computer, is already kind of, you know, fingerprinting yourself with a bunch of third parties. And so, uh, you know, it's always going to be a challenge, regardless of the crypto crypt cryptographic, you know, improvements that we make with Bitcoin and you know, changing clustering heuristics and all that. Just the fact that you have to access the computer um, is a hindrance to privacy. Now, that said, in comparison to credit card payments or anything like that, it's, a, it's probably better in many ways. Um, uh, but still, you know, that's definitely a, a challenge. Um, comp in comparison to gold, uh, you know, the cryptography behind Bitcoin is, um, you know, it's not proven on time scales of uh, on long term right. time scales, right? right. Um, all of this math is relatively new within the last few decades, uh, in terms of kind of at least the final implementation of the algorithms uh, in cryptographic primitives that Bitcoin uses. And, and, you know, it would be, in fact, surprising if that wasn't broken in the next hundred years, uh, frankly. Um, so that is something, you know, that we need to always be paying attention to. Um, and unlike gold, where it's just like a metal in the physical world, and that has thousands of years of history of, you know, not corroding and, you um, make it being very obviously difficult to just make gold out of thin air. Uh, you know, that's, that's kind of a always kind of looming uh, aspect to Bitcoin um, that, that other currencies don't have to deal with. Um, so honestly, those would be my biggest ones. And then, and then there's the whole kind of, uh, I guess there's also the whole, social consensus aspect to it, the whole economic model that secures it is based on humans um, at, at the end of the day, which are, is always a difficult thing to reason about, right? Um, and it's kind of a constantly changing landscape with miners and node operators and exchanges and, you know, people who hold Bitcoin and this, this kind of messy, um, everyone's fighting each other and we hope that stays stable kind of system. Whereas, you know, gold doesn't have to deal with that either. Right. It's just a, it's just an element. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I think those would be my three, you know, that's one, bullet of, points. that's one of the big catches that, you know, that's a, that's, that's one of the tricky things. And I'd, I'd be interested in knowing, I presume uh, at least a part of your daily activities at river. Well, there's a, a sales component to what you guys are doing, right. Promoting your services, sitting down with people, telling them about what you do, I presume explaining Bitcoin probably to a lot of, uh, you know, people that aren't too uh, understanding of what it represents. Am I right there? Yeah, absolutely. We're explaining yeah. Bitcoin to a lot of people very new to this. Yeah. And so when you come to the scarcity bit, which one, which is one of its, you know, primary value props, and there's comparisons to gold and other things throughout history, and you explain the concept of absolute scarcity, and you, but then you also, as you were just articulating, you explain how an aspect of it is socially upheld. Mm -hmm. um, when I've done that with, with, with people, I can see almost a deflation in, in their, in their like 
at attitude or attention when I do that, because they get, you know, the absolute scarcity makes sense. And I think a lot of people can see the value in something that's absolutely scarce. We can't increase the supply regardless of the demand. Mm -hmm. But then you, you know, the asterisk by that is that it's established both through the technology and through a social layer. And people, I guess, are just inherently untrusting of, of people or they know how fluid social dynamics can be. And that gives them some pause. How do you explain that or, or position that to people? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a few things there. So one is at the end of the day, every system has problems. Every system has drawbacks, right? I could go down the list with gold. I could go down the list with the Federal Reserve. Um, and, I, and, you know, I, at the end of the day, I deeply believe in Bitcoin success and its long term uh, future. And I think that all these potential issues are things that we will be able to continue to, to address and will be addressed. Um, and I have the best, you know, I, I, I'm personally have a very you know, significant skin in the game here in terms of the percentage of my own wealth that's held in Bitcoin. Um, and so, you know, want to make it very clear that you know, I deeply believe in this and we do as a company. Um, and it's not just, we're not just saying that, I mean, uh, our actions speak for themselves. Um, on top of that, the. I think when, when explaining the social aspect, actually, I had a conversation about this with a prospective client the other day was, you know, well, what guarantees that scarcity and what guarantees no one will change it? And, um, you know, I think the easiest thing to explain there is, well, you know, why would anyone who has Bitcoin change it? Like, why, why would they want more printed? No one who holds Bitcoin would want more. So it's not really in anyone's interest. Um, now there's always little caveats there, right? I mean, people could decide we need some inflation to pay miners, um, you know, down the road. And sometimes we go down that rabbit hole and, you know, I'm always very honest with, with clients. I'll never, never, um, you know, try to gloss over um, these things because uh, they're all very good questions and there's no perfect answer. Um, and I think a lot of it is just accepting like, well, no money is perfect. And this, you know, this is one of the gotchas of Bitcoin. Right. And do you think that, because this is another one that usually follows in these conversations, do you think absolute scarcity can, uh, can, can there be multiple instances of absolute scarcity or is it a one-off? You know, is, is Bitcoin the only instance of absolute scarcity that we can have? Or is it, do you think it's possible that there could be many uh, instances of absolute scarcity? In terms of other cryptocurrencies? Yeah, I guess, because that's kind of the only realm in which we can, you know, even attempt to create absolute scarcity. So I guess that's the, the question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, the other alternative would be someday some currency that you know, fits a paradigm that we've never considered before or can can reason about today, like, you know, energy cubes or something um, mm -hmm. where energy is the purest form of value or something right. like that. But um, uh, yeah, I mean, the answer is I don't know. Um, I do think that in terms from a monetary perspective, I think that there will always be a long tail of, you know, kind of minor digital, digitally scarce assets. Um, and I think there's gonna be one king and mm -hmm. I think Bitcoin is, going, is, is that king and will continue to be that king for a very long time, if not forever. Um, although nothing's forever, but, uh, so, so yeah, I mean, I guess the answer is, I think there's only going to be one, you know, absolute scarce resource that everyone agrees on. And then a lot of little ones that, you know, have their own little uses here and there. Yeah. I guess the question is more like, do, do we as a civilization have the capacity for more than one uh, instance of absolute scarcity, you know, like, will we just coalesce around one and everything else will be, you know, a form of scarcity, but not absolute, like almost on a philosophical, or is it the nature of absolute scarcity that it can either only be one instance or no instances, you know, because if the argument going, you know, if we have several instances, then how relevant or unique or even useful is any instance if, of absolute scarcity if there's several so like as a civilization do we have the do we only have the capacity to you know create and, uh, and use it once no right answer obviously but i'm just uh, getting your thoughts yeah you know 
I, I don't think the answer is completely, I, I lean towards yes. It's like a soft yes, right. that there's, there can only be one. But honestly, you know, I think there, it's, there's so many caveats there. I mean, we've had gold and silver for a long time, right? We have a lot of different precious metals, um, but gold is king, right? I do think we actually are used to this idea of like there being multiple, you know, scarce multiple scarcities, especially when it's geographically enforced by nation states and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I, I do think that there is always like one king, though, and I do think Bitcoin's going to be that. Yeah. But, but I don't think we can only have one from, from like a philosophical sense. I think people are used to having options. Mm-hmm. Um, speaking of phil- philosophy and, and such, did I hear in a previous pod that you either used to or do host like Socratic seminars and that kind of thing. Is that you? Yeah. So, uh, since COVID, we haven't had one um, because honestly, they're just much better in person than online, but um, hoping that can change soon. Yeah. So I help, I help run the San Francisco Bitcoin development meetup, which we have these events called Socratic seminars. They were inspired by New York bit devs uh, where it's basically just a big get together. And I prepare 20 to 30 topics for discussion. And then I just kind of lead the group through a discussion of each topic. Often it's very technical, um, pull requests into Bitcoin core, um, new research papers and things like that. I'm just the moderator and, you know, rely heavily, heavily on the talent in the audience to, um, share, you know, their thoughts on different, you know, happenings in the space, whether that's security of vulnerability or things like that. Right. And do actual, you know, do actual concrete things come out of these uh, sessions? Um, I think a lot of ideas, idea exchange happens. Um, right. I think there's a lot of, you know, mixing of, there's a lot of cross pollinating of ideas, which is really nice to see. I really love when I see that. Um, I see, you know, my favorite, my favorite, uh, um, like my favorite, my favorite thing to see at, at those events is when I see like somebody say something on one side of the room and then another person like thinks like kind of, you can tell like they're like thinking about that and then they came up with some other idea. Right. And they're going to go right. like home afterwards and, you know, explore this. And so um, yeah, I really, I really love that aspect of it. Nice. Um, I noticed in your Twitter profile that you, I think you, you said, you know, CEO founder of, of river, and then there's history and philosophy, like you're a history buff and a philosophy buff or something like that. Is I don't that think I have philosophy of history. Uh, or maybe not philosophy. Let me clear it here. History and engineering. History and engineering. Uh, okay. Okay. So, um, you know, I'm really into history as well. And, uh, you know, if there's a, if there's a specific uh, time period, I'd love to hear it. But also, you know, I'd love to get your comments, particularly because this is now the realm professionally that you operate in. And I'm sure this again are form the basis of a lot of conversations you're having with clients lately we're in these very uh historic to put it lightly times over the last three four months yeah especially economically and financially speaking what's your take on all of this do you relate it to you know certain periods in history and how are you articulating all this to clients uh you know when you speak with prospective or existing clients yeah i mean if we look at the economic aspects of what's happening I think it's very obvious that we're entering a new era of, you know, this monetary paradigm that we've lived in since the creation of the Federal Reserve and central banking. I don't pretend to know exactly how that's going to play out. I, I, you know, I, I'm not one to like pretend I can predict the future. I think these systems are so insanely complex that it would just be kind of ridiculous for me to try. Um, but that said, I do think the illusion of scarcity of the U.S. dollar is has been clearly busted. Down. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, they just printed like two trillion dollars out of thin air, and I think, you know, what's very obvious is that that's making a lot of people question this system. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, especially seeing the stock market hitting you know these crazy highs uh, at a time where, you know, a quarter of the United States isn't working. Um, is, is kind of insane. And so people are thinking more about these questions of what is money, you know, what is the right 
monetary system look like? And a lot of people are coming to the conclusion that I should think about alternatives here. And Bitcoin is kind of one of those that the people are very heavily looking at right now. Um, that's not to say that the US dollar is going to see a period of hyperinflation over the next five years. Um, I don't know. We might, I mean, we're seeing prices not go up a lot in the CPI, but you know, we're seeing stock market inflation. Um, so who knows what's going to happen there? Um, but also I think what you know, what people are kind of relating to back in previous periods in history, I don't think is I think it's hard to like kind of say this happened, this happened, this happened at some period in time before, but what people are seeing is um, unprecedented events in the market, unprecedented events, um, kind of levels of intervention taken by the government. And they're just starting to see, you know, kind of chaos, right? Like kind of looming on the horizon. And they don't know what that exactly is going to look like, but they can kind of sense it. And so then they're looking back in history and they're saying, okay, well, like what happened before, you know, when things kind of, when shit hit the fan and, um, I've had people ask me about Executive Order 6102, you know, when Franklin Roosevelt confiscated people's gold. Uh, he confiscated my great grandfather's gold and, and, and my, my co-founder and cousin, Andrew Benson, and, you know, the same great grandfather, um, you know, his gold was confiscated by Franklin Roosevelt. And so, you know, with Bitcoin, it's a little harder to do that. Right. And people are thinking about that. A number of people are thinking about that. Um, they're also looking at what happened in Cyprus with, you know, haircuts and, and, and there's, you know, so I think, yeah. So I, I think the, the general trend here is just people feel chaos looming and they're trying to figure out what to do about that. Did your grandfather ever get his gold back? Uh, I don't know. No, I don't think he did. My great grandfather. Great yeah. grandfather. Sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, and, and do, does, does river or, or you in these conversations ever point to, because it's always that the, one of the tragedies of history is it's so difficult to objectively assess the period of time you're in uh, when you're in it. You know, in hindsight, it's so damn easy. You look at cases of hyperinflation in France or in Germany or in various other places where there, you know, a paper current in China was instituted at various other times in history. And in hindsight, you're like, duh, what a bunch of idiots. How come they, you know, how come they did that? But in the current moment, the status quo is so intoxicating that oftentimes people fail to see the trends that are happening or fail just to, to believe that things can actually change so dramatically or fail so catastrophically, uh, such, like so catastro catastrophically, catastrophically. <laughs> Thank you. Um, do you like broach those types of subjects with your clients or do you not have to sell so hard as it were? And just like when by the time they're in front of you, they kind of have, they already have this kind of line of thinking and they're just trying to figure out ways to protect themselves. Typically they have this line of thinking already once they've come to us. Um, you know, I don't like fear mongering. Uh, I don't think that's like a, you know, healthy way to sell things. Yeah. Um, I, I just like kind of laying out objectively kind of what this provides you. If you've decided that um, this is something you wanted to, you know, some sort of event like this is something you wanted to hedge against. And um and so, yeah, um, that's kind of how we approach it with our clients. Mm -hmm. And what would you say would characterize, you know, I, I imagine you have kind of a broad demo of, of clients. You mentioned, you know, kind of high net worth family office types. I'm sure there's a lot of retail types. Where, what's the mix for you guys right now? Or is there a desired mix for you? Yeah, so we see, we see it all really. Um, you know, our focus is what we like to call the emerging affluent and up. So, you know, just as a small company, right, we have to focus our resources. Um, we can't provide every person in the world, you know, like top notch customer service, right? We kind of have to f scope our services to, you know, what makes the most sense for us today. And right, and right now, we're fo our focus is kind of that higher end demographic who's, you know, either, you know, wants to buy more Bitcoin or is buying the Bitcoin for the first time and wants a higher level of professionalism and service in the, in the institution that they're trusting to do that. Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, that means that our, our client base does tend to skew a bit older, uh, probably than a company like Coinbase or, uh, or, you know, companies like that. Um, we do have people, you know, most of our volume is driven by people over the age of 55. Wow. And, but that said, we do have, I mean, 
the median age of our clients is probably, you know, it's like in the upper thirties. Um, but we do have quite a number of clients, you know, significantly older than that. Yeah. And has interest been picking up since, you know, over the last three, four months based on what's been going on, like people ringing you up and not necessarily your sales team or however you guys do that. Yeah. So most of our business comes in from referrals and word of mouth. Um, and, uh, that's our focus is, you know, when we make our clients very happy, they'll bring us, they'll, they'll introduce their friends. Yeah. Uh, we want to be the answer, you know, when somebody who, you know, there's a subset of people, you know, and we're probably among them who are kind of the Bitcoin person in their family or their friend group. And they're always talking about it. And we want to be that place where, you know, when their friends ask them finally, Hey man, like I want to buy some Bitcoin now, like where should I go? Right. We want, we want to be the place where they set where they send them because we, we, we've given them the experience to know that if, if you send your friends to river, they'll be taken care of, right? They're not going to come back to you saying, what the heck, man, like I wired money, to this company, it just disappeared, blah, blah, blah. I can't get anybody on the phone. Um, we'll be, we'll be the place where, you know, your friends and your family will get the best service. Right. And with the kind of services you're offering right now, what's the, the rev model? Like you, you're helping people purchase Bitcoin, set up accounts. Like wh- how do you guys make money? Basically we make money on the, on, um, trading fees. So when someone buys Bitcoin uh, or sells Bitcoin, we make, uh, we take a cut of, of the, those fees, just like, you know, most of the other companies that are Bitcoin on ramps today. That said, long term, um, our goal is to cross sell financial services. Mm-hmm. Uh, we just see that as the first step in this journey, right? Getting new people into Bitcoin, but mm-hmm. there's a whole world of financial services once people actually have Bitcoin to provide. Right. And so, you know, one of the one of the other kind of interesting aspects of this idea of like, what does a Bitcoin bank look like? Well, we don't have a Federal Reserve to store our coins at and get an overnight interest rate, right? Um, so, you know, unless so, you you kind of have two options: either we're holding your funds in full reserve, your your, your Bitcoin in full reserve, or we're helping you put it to work, right? And it's not. And, and when you're storing funds with us, it's not by default being lent out, right? We're holding everything in full reserve, and then you would explicitly choose to put that Bitcoin to work in other ways if you so want, if you wanted to, right? And so that's a different paradigm than the banking system today, right? The assumption when you deposit money at a bank today is like 90% of it is getting loaned out. Um, right. And so, um, so in terms of like other financial services that we plan to offer, uh, as I mentioned, it's going to be a mix of, uh, you know, from a mix of custodial financial services where, where, we're, where we hold your Bitcoin uh, to non-custodial services, where we're kind of this reporting layer on funds that you control. And we seamlessly help you, um, we seamlessly help merge those two worlds for people. Right. And you guys offer like an automated DCA buy option as well, right? Yep. You can buy one off, buy DCA. We support orders all the way. We, so, you know, we support orders either just, you know, when you buy, we debit from your bank account after the fact, uh, or you can wire us money up front and we have clients who buy, you know, millions and millions of dollars of Bitcoin from us at, at any one time. Uh, right. Through that method. Actually, it's funny you say that because I remember it must have been three, four months uh, ago now, at least. But it was someone was interacting with you on, on Twitter. And I think they were inquiring about one off purchases. And you said you can do one off purchases up to a limit of two hundred and fifty million dollars. Uh, and that surprised me because it felt like a large number to me. How would you go about filling an order like that? So we have pretty deep relationships with a number of with quite a lot of liquidity um, providers and, you know, all, all, all over. And so you know, with very large orders, what we do with our clients is that those will actually get placed over the phone, uh, a little old school. But um, that gives us the ability to go out to our sources uh, get quotes, pull it all together for the client um, and, you know, be able to you know, be flexible enough depending on market conditions. Right. But in this, in the Bitcoin uh, markets, who are liqui- the liquidity providers? Like, are you talking about both kind of bigger trading desks, other trading operations, private individual, like how do you source the liquidity? If, if a big order like that came in, who are these people? Everything. Like, you know, we, so you, 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 you go about finding a relationship with someone that says like, if you need liquidity, I've got it sort of thing. Yeah. I mean, our, our, like, you know, a lot of our, a lot of what we spend our time doing is going out and building relationships with people 
to buy Bitcoin from, um, really? whether that's desks, whether that's exchanges, whether that's, you know, other firms, um, you know, that's, that's part of our business. Right. And so, uh, that's a, that's a continually kind of, that's something we we're, we continually improve as we grow here. Um, and we we're scaling this, you know, with demand, obviously. Right. Um, do you think a lot of people that come on, you know, become clients with, with River, are they looking at this with a kind of a long term time horizon, you know, investing in Bitcoin, becoming quote unquote hodlers or, are, are you know, is there a certain characterization, characterization, characterization of the clients that you guys get? Yeah, they're, they're, it's almost exclusively long term, um, which is generally what you'll see with kind of the client segment that we focus the higher end. Right. Um, there's a reason these people have money. It's usually because they're longer term thinkers, right? right. Um, and so, you know, it kind of, it, it's kind of like, kind of comes with the territory that most of these folks are in it for for a longer time period. Right. And you know, if 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 you're talking about somewhat high net worth people, or as you say, they have money because they're relatively sophisticated in this domain. Do they put much? You know, do they hold your feet to the fire in terms of all this? Because I'm sure. This is, either, you know, either they see it as being somewhat new, they're not too sure about it. Maybe they've heard a lot of, you know, criticisms, scam, blah, blah, blah in the past. Like, do they really, you know, come at you? Or again, have they mostly been sold and they're looking for the best way to get involved? They've mostly been sold. I mean, these are all generally very smart people. They've done their own research and they've right. decided to pull the trigger. And they've, you know, they'll, they'll ask us questions to say, you check the research, but you know, we're not cold calling somebody who's never heard of Bitcoin and trying to sell them Bitcoin. Right. right. Um, uh, and so, you know, there's, there's always been some sort of like time, time period that they've kind of gotten warmed up to the idea and, and finally decided to make an allocation. Right. What's the hardest part about what you guys are doing? So, when did you start River? Um, officially, the company was incorporated in February 2019. And then we launched the product we made it generally available at the beginning of this year. Holy shit. Well, so yeah. very new, but what's, you know, what's been the, the hardest uh, or unexpected aspects of doing all this from your perspective? Yeah, let's see. That's a good question. So the hardest part, um, the most time consuming thing has definitely been the state by state regulations, uh, having to go state by state in the 50 U S states to try to operate. Uh, has been by far the biggest headache and source of frustration, especially because we have clients, you know, especially in you know, a state like New York, right? There's a lot of potential business there and we have all these people asking to use our service and we're like, I really wish we could serve you, but we're not allowed to. And that's definitely probably the hardest part of this. Um, that will, that problem will go away, you know, once we're, once we're in all the States, but um, it's definitely been the most frustrating part of it. Uh, so yeah, you know, that's, that's definitely one aspect. Um, from a technical perspective, it's been very fun, right? We built this all from the ground up. Uh, we built our own Bitcoin wallet that will allow us to provide a bunch of cool, like Bitcoin native functionality that we're going to be rolling out here over the next month or so. Cool. Um, and, uh, you know, and then of course the, the normal kind of stressors with running a Bitcoin company is just like always being super vigilant about security. Um, and, uh, in, in, in the, privacy of our clients. I mean, all of that is just stuff we're super paranoid about and, you know, never, you know, we, we can never let our guard down there. Yeah. How many people are on the team? We have 13 full time. And my sense is that, well, a lot of companies in the Bitcoin space, uh, you know, the people wind up there because they're extremely kind of dedicated or passionate uh, about Bitcoin. And so, I find the co the kind of company culture in Bitcoin companies fairly unique because of that, because you basically have like a team full of zealots who just really want this to succeed and are pretty much, uh, you know, very grateful that they can both earn a living and work towards something like this. Does that characterize, you know, like the kind of vibe you guys have going on over there? Absolutely. Yeah. Hiring has been one of those things that we've been very blessed with uh, to kind of um, have a lot, a number of p great people who want to work here. And, uh, and it's, it's such, it, it's just so incredible to be able to work with people who all share this mission. Right. right. Um, that's higher, that's higher than the company itself, which keeps us honest. Right. Yeah. It's, it, it's, a, it, that, that's actually a, um, uh, 
source of kind of, I don't want to use the word regulation, a, um, a check as a check on the company, right? Because, um, you know, if, if our company strays from the mission, then most people at the company will leave because they don't, they no longer care about what the company is doing. Right. So by nature of hiring people who care about Bitcoin, the company has to continue to push Bitcoin forward and right. not stray from that mission, which yeah. is kind of cool. I like that. It's awesome. It's, it's, yeah, it's incredible. Um, how do you guys, you know, there's so much development in this space and things happen so fast. How do you guys prioritize, you know, what's most important from an organizational perspective so that you guys can continue to be a business and make money and, you know, using limited resources and stuff like that. Do you have any particular process for prioritization of, of things you want to do? Yeah. I mean, we don't have some formal, it's very formal process. We have kind of this running list of things that kind of the, the, pri the priority queue that very often changes, um, you know, but our focus right now is on growing our customer base, growing our revenue and, um, you know, efforts that, uh, you know, push those things, you know, push those numbers up. Right. right. Um, at the end of the day, like we're not a charity, right. We have to make money. We have to be self-sustaining. And um, if we're going to build all the really cool Bitcoin stuff we want to build, we have to be making money. Uh, right. And so, um, you know, that's our core focus right now is, uh, growing our order volumes and then cross-selling financial services to have a kind of broader revenue base that's less susceptible to the um, vicissitudes of the market. And, um, you know, because, you know, you know how Bitcoin goes, right? Like if you're purely a volume-driven revenue company, your revenue is, you know, 10 times last month what it is this month and who knows what right. next month's revenue is going to be depending on what whatever the market does, you know, so right. we want to not be completely at the, at the mercy of that. And do you guys plan to be an international organization or do you just want to kind of dominate in the U S and, you know, there's obviously point, lots of opportunity there at some point. Yes. Um, just a matter of this. Yeah. This comes down to prioritization, right? Our focus right now is the United States um, going to other countries next year. We'll start exploring the, 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 that possibility. Mm -hmm. Um, but we have no business in other countries until we can kind of support our own, uh, fully. Yeah. So, um, it's just every, every country comes with its own unique set of laws, banking relationships. And, um, you know, we're just not at a size where we can support that many different jurisdictions. Right. You know, in the, in the Bitcoin space, we often, there's a lot of dialogue and discussion about regulatory efforts that may stifle, uh, Bitcoin's adoption or growth or what have you. Um, and you were mentioning how you have to engage with the regulators in the different states you want to operate in. And that's very time consuming and blah, blah, blah. Are you concerned that, you know, push comes to shove if, if Bitcoin act genuinely becomes a threat to the existing paradigm that a business that's so reliant on regulatory approval could just be dead in the water very quickly? It's possible. Um, that's why I do think at some point regular jurisdictional diversity is important for the health of the business. Um, cause who knows what country might ban Bitcoin someday. That said, I'm, I'm an American. Um, I love my country and, you know, as somebody who loves my country, my goal is to keep my country on the direction that I want to see it on. And so that means that, um, you know, helping make sure that that does not happen in the United States. Um, so, you know, that's how I think about it. Yeah. What's most exciting you these days? You know, other than the recent announcement, raising money, I'm sure that was a big boon for you and the team. Like what either on the technology or on the business side or even, you know, uh, socially or whatever, what's, you know, jazzing you up and, and consuming a lot of your intellectual time these days? Yeah. So um, we think that there's just like a huge opportunity to like seamlessly integrate all I think we're at, let me rewind. I think we, that there's been so much great work done over the past few years on these standards for Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin protocol level stuff, whether that's standards for describing wallets, standards for transactions with partially signed Bitcoin transactions. Um, and all these standards that have created a common language that different pieces of software can use to communicate Bitcoin information. So. I think this has given us a huge opportunity to seamlessly merge the worlds of, you know, a Bitcoin brokerage or exchange like us 
and people's self custody and people's you know um, you know self sovereign sort of financial tooling. And so a lot of the thinking we're doing at the protocol level right now is looking at kind of how we can how can we create this world where we're like this hub and um, seamlessly integrating with your hardware wallets and your nodes and things like that. Um, and so I'm really excited about that work, to, not just in our own product, but just kind of that continued work at the, in the Bitcoin protocol level. Um, I think Taproot is going to be really cool. I'm really excited for Schnorr signatures and um, all, all, also a lot of the privacy improvements that people are working on and the standards again and standards and protocols around that. So whether that's coin swap, um, Lightning Network uh, uh, improvements, I think there's huge potential there. Uh, really excited to see what Strike's doing. I think Lightning has tremendous potential. We support Lightning um, and really look forward to helping push that, uh, continue to push that forward as well. Nice. Um, well, man, this has been awesome. I usually finish off uh, these chats with a quick word association. You you down for that? Yeah, let's do it. So I'll say a word. You tell me the first thing that pops into your head. All right. Democracy. Uh Weirdly, I thought Bitcoin. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> the Lightning Network. Um, you know, uh, spending. Government. Um, necessary evil. Violence. Um, uh, unfortunate. Trump. Different. Ego. Um, I don't have blank. FOMO. Bitmax. Wealth. Sound money. Privacy. Cryptography. Hate speech. Hate speech. Um, uh, hate speech. Uh, uh, pass. I don't know. Gold. Shiny. Guns. Nine millimeter. Revolution. 1776. Socialism. Uh, uh, problematic. Family. Beautiful. Inequality. Um, uh, um, oof. Uh, a challenge. Hell. The devil. Liberty. Beautiful. Energy. The source of everything. Bitcoin. Beautiful. That's it, Alex. Um, this has been fun, man. I really appreciate the time. Uh, I don't want to take up too much more of yours. So we'll have to put a pin in this until we, uh, we connect in meet space someday. But before we sign off, was there anywhere you wanted to direct people or any last words? Um, yeah, if, I mean, if, if anyone has, a, has any questions or just wants to chat about River or kind of anything we chat about, John, um, feel free to reach out to me. Um, you can hit me up on Twitter at, uh, at Leishman, uh, L-E-I-S-H-M-A-N, or at Alex at River.com. And uh, yeah, if you're ever interested in trying out River, feel free to message me and I can help you get set up. Awesome, man. Well, look, I'm, uh, I'm super pumped for you guys. Really happy about the recent funding round. And uh, I can't wait to continue watching you guys grow and develop and see what happens. So keep up the great work. Thanks, John. Thanks for having me on the show. All right. See you, bro.